Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 44, Capitalism on a Ventilator, featuring Sarah Flounders. Sarah Flounders is a writer and an activist who has been involved in progressive and anti-war organizing since the 60s. She is a member of the Secretariat of the Workers' World Party, co-founder of the International Action Center, and a frequent contributor to the Workers' World newspaper. She has traveled, spoken, and organized extensively on behalf of justice and in opposition to imperialism, and it was an honor to speak to someone who is so accomplished. The focus of our conversation was the just-released book, Capitalism on a Ventilator, The Impact of COVID-19 in China and the U.S., of which Sarah is a co-editor. The volume is an anthology of articles by over 50 activists and independent journalists from around the world covering the pandemic from December 2019 to August of this year. The book covers a lot of ground under the overarching theme of cooperation versus competition. We discuss the basic facts of China's response, including the role of their local community associations, how younger people in the U.S. are more skeptical of capitalism than older generations, the sorry state of health in the U.S., the myth of Chinese backwardness, the U.S. military's pivot to Asia, China's aid to countries all over the world, the role of the U.S. media in concealing the broader picture of the problems within U.S. healthcare, the squashing of alternative media online by algorithms, the bipartisan consensus in the U.S., and the censorship of this book by Amazon. Thanks for joining me today, Sarah. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. I very much uh, value these conversations, really. I was really excited to see this book. You are the editor of Capitalism on a Ventilator, uh, editor with another person, uh, Lee Siu Hin. The Impact of COVID-19 in China and the U.S., one of my frustrations this year in following the news about COVID has been the lack of attention to really almost anything going on outside of the United States. And uh, when there is information about things going on outside the United States, it's usually just Europe. And then if it's about China, it really uh, seems like there's a lot of propaganda that's involved. So I've been reading through your book the last few days, and your book really is what I've been looking for, and that it's, it's a really offering, this picture that we haven't been getting otherwise. And... This is intentional. It's not an accident. I mean, when you consider the endless chatter, thousands and thousands of news articles coming at us from every possible direction, and there is no real comparison on between what the United States is doing as policy or lack of policy and what has been so incredibly successful in China, also in Vietnam, in Cuba, in uh, several other countries, which used a social mobilization of the whole population and scientific measures that have been known for even a thousand years. There have been quarantines and understanding the importance of uh, separating uh, during any kind of you know, a a huge uh, spread of disease. I mean, this is not unknown or a surprise, and it's done very successfully when the whole population understands it. Uh, Now, in a modern scale, when it's combined with testing on in an aggressive way, when it's combined with the best of treatment, and also when the population knows that food and rent and the things that are important for survival past the pandemic are guaranteed, are taken care of, then the results are remarkably different. In China today, this is a controlled, a contained virus. That doesn't mean it's not deadly, very deadly. They're taking it very seriously. 
even now. But there was none of that in the U.S. And as a matter of fact, Instead, there was layers and layers of ridicule of China in the first two months of whole anti-China campaigns of, of uh, speculation if this would bring down China, of description of how repressive the measures of, of masks and a shutdown and even a canceling of the major holiday uh, of the year and canceling travel, how repressive all these things were. It it fit into a whole drumbeat of anti-China uh, propaganda. Really, there's no other word. It's propaganda coming from the media. It, it comes from the trade war and the sanctions and the military encirclement, which has been policy since the Obama-Biden administration and throughout the Trump years. So all of this combined – all of this aggressively combined into ridicule in the beginning and then lack of doing anything for months. So we're 10 months into this and it's an unmitigated disaster, a disaster. There's no other way of counting what will be 300,000 deaths this week. This week we'll reach that 300,000 level and we're being told it will go past a half million isn't that incredible? Disastrous. There's no other way of looking at it. And in China, still below 5,000. So it really shows a difference. And why we're not getting that discussion, uh, why that is being cut out, <laughs> we need to examine much more clo closely. Right. Right, definitely. I'm I'm very interested in in discussing that, and I want to start with uh, maybe you could just give us the basic facts of how China did deal with it at the beginning there, because I think that even just the very basic story is something that most people don't know, even many people on the left. Well, that's what uh, China. As soon as before, there was one death. There had not yet been one reported death in China uh, when on December 30th, China alerted the World Health Organization of a potentially dangerous new virus causing a severe pneumonia. Uh, and they began studying it right away. And within a couple of weeks, they released uh, the entire uh, genome, the sequencing as to the whole world. They didn't treat this as a secret. They began aggressive measures within Wuhan to meet this pandemic and to try to shut down. First, they speculated it came from a, a, a food market, a, a, an animal market, and they shut that down, sanitized, cleaned, scrubbed, did everything, and restricted the population around there. Then they alerted the whole population. All of this was done in January. Uh, actually, it is interesting to know that the, the deaths came after, even the first death even. There had been a handful of people sick with a new virus they had not yet identified, and they immediately notified the World Health Organization. And they notified the U.S. directly, directly. It was not taken seriously because – Diseases are not monitored in that way in the United States at, at all, at all. In a bad flu year here, there'll be 60,000 deaths, and that's considered acceptable by U.S. standards, and that's already higher than many places in the world. So China understood both what to do, and they began a mobilization early on. Now, that has been flipped by the U.S. from ridiculing it at first talking about the extreme and repressive measures China was taking. And then later, as I say, they flipped the story to say China didn't notify the world. They're responsible. They were derelict. Uh, so now we don't really know where exactly this virus came from, how long it had been circulating around. But the first known cases that China had, they immediately, in Wuhan, they immediately notified New, Wuhan is a, a big industrial city and very much a, you know, a mega city in terms of – it's like the Chicago, I think you could say, of um, China. Uh, 
And so it this didn't happen in a small rural town. Right. And the measures that they took there uh, were the basic common sense measures that one would expect with uh, masking. They shut down uh, stores, except those that were absolutely essential. And then they also, uh, because so many people were suddenly put out of work or suddenly um, isolated, they provided for people uh, both monetarily and I believe with uh, such things as food delivery and medicine delivery, too. And that was the amazing thing. You see, in China, on every housing unit, there is a community association. Uh, and there are party associations um, that exist at down to the very lowest level in China. They were immediately mobilized to ensure that everyone had food deliveries, emergency medical needs taken care of, and were fully alerted to the importance of social distancing. The other thing that's so interesting is that people's paychecks were guaranteed. If they were government or state workers, that was guaranteed. And there was pressure put on every privately owned company in China doing business in China to cover the paychecks of their employees. There was an interesting article that's it's referred to in the book about even Starbucks. You know, they have uh, some 4,000 Starbucks in China. Uh, they paid all their workers during the quarantine times. Now, did they do that in the U.S.? I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, they did it because it was mandated in China. And if they wanted to continue to do business, that was the cost of doing business, that they, during this time, take care of their workforce and guarantee the continued health and protection of the workers. The other interesting thing that was done, and this was done on a national level, is a freeze on all rent, mortgage, or credit card bills. I mean, can you imagine? We can't even conceive of that happening here. Uh, in some areas, based on municipality or city, there have been, uh, and, and even nationally for a short time, there were eviction moratoriums. A lot of people did still get evicted and their rents continued to accumulate. But in China, it was mandated. And this is also true, by the way, in, in Vietnam. Immediately, they took the message. There's a very interesting chapter in the book describing the policy and the program in Vietnam, where there's, I think, under still under 100 um, deaths in, in Vietnam, very, very low number. And they did it with a social mobilization, guaranteeing food, and freezing all rent, credit card, any kind of payments that were due, no worry during this time. So these community associations that you mentioned, that's something that we don't really have an equivalent of here in the United States. We really don't. Uh, every effort is made under capitalism you know, as a way of ensuring private property and the rule of a handful to keep the millions of vast population disorganized, unorganized. As a matter of fact, even membership in labor unions is at a historic all-time low. I, I believe it's like down to 7%. Uh, every effort of community and neighborhood groups uh, is discouraged in the U.S. The idea that every single housing unit uh, has an organized social unit. It does not exist in the U.S. And these organized groups are a real basis for solidarity, of, of looking out for each other. Uh, it, it is a concept uh, that doesn't exist here. Frankly, there, there's just no other way of, of um, here. It's in, instead, it's criticized. Oh, you're going to have your neighbors peeking in your windows. You're going to have old people checking up on the young, and, and so on. We've all heard the criticisms of it, but looking at it as a way of people caring about each other, that is what is promoted very, very actively in China and has been. It's a way that they overcame a complete colonial uh, chaos that had been imposed by imperialist countries looting China for 200 years. How did they overcome it? 
the the Chinese revolution was a huge historic accomplishment in world history. But it was really the organization of workers, of peasants. It involved party organization, yes, but it also involved organizing the whole population to solve problems themselves and particularly to solve the problems of rampant disease they had a way with all pest campaigns and all kinds of things like that. Uh, illiteracy and and really the most primitive housing you could imagine. All of this was done in collective campaigns. So it's deeply imbued in the population. And, and we could look at that also with, with Cuba, with Vietnam, where it was a mobilization of the whole people down to the most basic level that brought them the gains. People then understood when we mobilize, we're not defenseless. When we look out for each other, we're stronger, we're cohesive. These were lessons that come to people historically and they then understand, they look out for each other. Uh, Everything goes the opposite way in the United States where individualism is always heightened and the strongest survive, and uh, there's levels and layers of racism and bigotry that are consciously promoted as a way of keeping people divided and being suspicious of, of anyone uh, knowing too much about your life. So I, I think the difference we can see, we, we face a problem today with COVID-19, we will face these problems in the future. This is not unique. Uh, We will face uh, other viruses that may be as deadly, more deadly. We will face environmental catastrophe. Do we look out for each other? Are there huge evacuations? Is there emergency housing provided? These are the problems that take, for, for civilization at this level of technology, new ways of social organization. And in the United States, we're far behind solving any of this. Every crisis, the the wealth of the multi-billionaires increases, and poverty at the most basic level also increases. So there's a collective way, and there's an individualistic way that benefits only the super rich. I think that's becoming clearer, and it's a discussion that is not encouraged in the U.S. today. I think that distinctions like that um, are becoming clearer to the younger people in the United States. I I hear a lot more talk from them about inequality. Uh, I'm I'm about 50. And so from the people in their 20s and 30s, I definitely hear more talk about inequality and, you know, even the right of billionaires to exist. And so I'm definitely, you know, encouraged by that. But I think it's also a matter of will there be enough time uh, for the younger generation to be able to come up and, and make changes, uh, especially considering how the uh, leadership of the United States is, 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 has, is aging and not letting go. Uh, certainly for the younger generation, in every poll they do, there is increasingly a hatred of capitalism, of understanding that, that the system itself is the problem. Uh, what to do, how to proceed, that's a bigger uh, you could say ideological question, <clears throat> organizational question, but there is increasingly uh, a deep interest in socialism, in socialist measures, uh, and even what are the rights of people in a wealthy, modern, developed technological society? Do we have a right to eat, a right to good housing, a right to free, full health care? a right to the most advanced education freely provided. Does society owe this to the population? Uh, Or are we all going to end up indebted, impoverished, um, sickly? You know, the the, uh, levels in the United States, even before COVID, uh, of life expectancy were actually declining. And of measures like... uh, uh, maternity 
uh, ex- uh, life expectancy, uh, infant life expectancy, were actually on the decline in the U.S. They had been going forward for 100 years. So we see what happens, uh, and, and it's even worse based on racism in the U.S. Life expectancy for a black man in the U.S. today is lower than in Bangladesh. What does that mean? This is the count of racism and bad health care and incredible pressure um, of a racist society. So these are problems that predate COVID, but COVID like pushes it all to the front. Uh, I think in a way that that we didn't realize how quickly these, these problems would come up. It's like a forest fire. You let a little thing burn. Okay, it's just a little flame, and now it's just a little house, and now it's entire mountainsides. Uh, and the even the vaccine, they say, the vaccine acts like a fire hose. It can put out small fire, it can, can even put out a house fire. But against a forest fire, against a conflagration, it's all but useless. So that's the situation we face today. We have a big problem. We didn't take care of it. And now we face a forest fire that is ripping through the population. Yes. Uh, in, in the book, there's um, someone from South Africa who talks about how there was already a crisis that existed. And now we have the additional crisis of COVID on, on top of it. That's so true. I mean, today in the United States today, and this is true, but here especially, it's true around the world, uh, a triple uh a triple pandemic, you could say. There's no other way of describing it. We face the disease, the virus. Uh, we face a complete capitalist meltdown, uh, which exceeds anything of, of this century from what they're saying in terms of the impact of it. Certainly, it's already greater than the 2008 and going back to 1929. Uh, that's on the economic level. Now, Of course, this system understands there there is a capitalist crisis every seven to 10 years has been for 300 years, but this one is worse than ever. So we face that at the same time as a disease pandemic. And we also really face uh, a pandemic, there's no other way to say it, of of police violence and murder. The Black Lives Movement uh, really was millions of people responding in the streets during a time of COVID. Uh, the demonstrations that that uh, this June and July uh, were just enormous. And it was in response to a political uh, problem in the midst of an economic and a health crisis. Uh, so, it, it, and it showed the determination of millions of people to come out for the demands of of equality, the demands of treatment by police units, um, more than a thousand deaths a year from the cops. So outrage at the police and the pandemic and the economic crisis, you could say all this kind of comes together uh, in this 2020 year. Everyone says, oh, we just want the year to be over, as if we'll ever go back to some level of normalcy. I, I don't see that happening. Well, and as if the normal that we had before was something that was even working. Right, right. That's so true. That's that's exactly that's exactly true. Uh, wasn't working at all. Uh, but but there's no going back to that fractured, um, chaotic society. I, I think there is much worse ahead for us. Could you speak to the myth of Chinese backwardness when it comes to uh, science, um, uh, culture, technology, the whole, everything. Everyone, you know, in the United States sort of considers that or believes that we're on top, uh, and we're the best. But, you know, I think that this situation really showed, um, that that's not true. China today is, is, uh, developing at a staggering rate. It's, it's economic development already exceeds the U S. Uh, and, it's, it's interesting the way in which um, the 2008 economic crisis impacted the U.S., where here the banks were bailed out. There was no real bailout of the people. 
Uh, in China, what happened was they didn't bail out the capitalists. Instead, a lot of the foreign investment just collapsed overnight, but China used that time for huge infrastructure development of highways, of roads, of railroads, of subway lines. Uh, and it was a huge jobs program, yes. Uh, it was also brought um, technology and industry into a new level. It had already been developing very rapidly, but it sort of leapfrogged in the last uh, 10 and 12 years, much faster than the U.S. ever expected it to happen. Uh, I was in, in China in October of 2019. Uh, there were, there, it was a celebration of the 70th anniversary of the victory of the Chinese Revolution. It was a time of enormous celebration in China. Of course, this was pre-COVID by a few months. But I was really staggered to see uh, Shanghai, Beijing, Nanjing, other cities. Uh, you have 20 new subway lines just in, in uh, Shanghai, uh, about the same in Beijing. Bullet trains, uh, huge modern complexes, housing in the, in the millions and millions of units, new housing going up. Uh, it was pretty impressive. The level of and the level of enthusiasm that that made uh, of, of people who felt they had faced a prosperous, uh, organized future. Uh, I mean, I, I was amazed to be in subways where every single stop was not only spotlessly clean. I mean, I live in New York and New Jersey, <laughs> right? It's just in, incredibly filthy and not working. But every single subway um, stop had clean restrooms, escalators, elevators, bright lighting. Uh, I mean, they were just amazing to me. Uh, and and everywhere also there were guidelines, health guidelines, uh, guidelines to make room for disabled and seniors and, you know, all of those uh, social pro, um, uh, education too going on. Uh, I, I was really impressed by this. Uh, now, the response from Wall Street, from corporate rule in the U.S., has been what is called the Axis to Asia. This came in under the Obama-Biden administration. Oh, the, the, uh, the pivot to Asia, I believe. Pivot, uh, right. I'm sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. Pivot to Asia. Uh, and, and what was the pivot to Asia? It was a military response that the U.S. should move and reorganize its troops, its missile batteries, its aircraft carriers to surround China, that China was a new threat. What was China doing that was so threatening? Well, they had literally ended poverty, bringing 800 million people out of poverty was a really aggressive program of these past years and, and sort of finalized in the last year, year and a half. That is threatening to the U.S., frankly, along with these new ports and harbors and railroads and China's active new trade with the world, uh, the Belt and Road, the, what's called the New Silk Road, uh, which is uh, organizing with countries around the world new levels of trade and development. It's about 10 times the size of the Marshall Program. Nothing like that is being offered in the U.S. today. Is even under discussion uh, to in its relations with any other country. So these contrasts you could really see, and you could see the both the level of the solidarity they have built internally. Can this level of technical development and and care uh, transform whole parts of the world. Now, we'll have to see because these are also business deals made with existing states, uh, but certainly it, China is offering something that the United States today is incapable of offering. And so also are all the NATO countries of Europe. They're offering weapons. They're offering uh, indebtedness through new new generations of weapons, but they are not offering 
anyone economic development in Africa, in Asia, or in Latin America. And so it's a stark difference, and many countries around the world find this a real lifeline. The same thing is true, by the way, just to jump to another topic on this, with the vaccines. Vaccines in the U.S. are for the population here. And Trump has made that clear, and so is, frankly, as the CDC and every health organization. Vaccines are for the population of the U.S. first in some staggered release program. And we have, with, with Pfizer and Moderna, the most um, expensive, uh, uh, technologically refined and patented top secret um, uh, vaccines you can imagine uh, that have to be kept at an ultra cold all the way through almost to, from de- to delivery just before uh, uh, injection. Uh, every one of them with a tag even to measure the level of coldness. Is that possible for the rest of the world? It's not even being considered. It's what, what will the people of Africa, the rest of the people of Asia uh, do? What will the people throughout Latin America do? And how do you distribute a vaccine in the ultra cold uh, not being considered? A certain number will be sold in Europe. Uh, those purchases are already going forward. Now, China took a different approach to developing vaccines. They used an older form of technology, closer to how the, the polio vaccine was made. It's, it's low tech. Uh, it can be copied by anyone. It's not patented. The materials for it are being distributed around the world. How to make it is being distributed. And it only has to be kept at a refrigeration level. Uh, now that's dramatically different. And they're delivering literally millions and millions, tens of millions of dosages of this and have already signed contracts and begun shipping. So there's a difference uh, between what technology can do. It can either give privatized, uh, expensive vaccines. Billions of dollars went to these corporations. And then in turn, they sell the vaccines and make billions in, in addition, uh, or you can provide it free to the world. So there again comes the, the choice of will we have cooperation, will we have solidarity, or will we have competition and profits and military buildup? It, it's a real choice you can see driving through all of this. One choice being made here, one choice being made in China. I had heard nothing at all about the Chinese vaccine, so I, I really appreciate that information. I'll send you an article, by the way, that I wrote just this week on that. And I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to um, just let me say on that. Um, the, the China vaccine may not be uh, as effective. If you have a vaccine that's 80% effective versus 95% effective for the Pfizer and Moderna. Um, but that's consider flu vaccines that are 60% effective and yet people run out to get it because that's a good odd. Uh, if, if lots of people are vaccinated, a very good odd and if it's easily available. So, um, as I say, I, I sent, uh, I did an article based on what I could understand of the difference in technology and the difference in accessibility and the determination in, in China to make this available to the world and um, contrasting that to the U.S. saying, no, we're taking care of everybody here first. We're, you know, we're less than 5% of the population of the world. Uh, we're not going to think about the other 95%. Well, that's going to take the whole planet down pretty fast. Yeah, I'll put a link to that article in the show notes so that the listeners can look it up. in a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... 
And that, that brings me to my next question, which was that I was uh, uh, hoping you could tell us more about how China and as well Cuba has been uh, offering aid all over the world, not only to, say, Latin America and Africa, but also to Europe, Canada, and I believe even Oregon got some help from China. The amount of emergency help from China, and that included, you know, mass respirators, basic PPE equipment that uh, came out of China was absolutely staggering. Uh, and it came to the U.S. in huge plane loads. Uh, as a matter of fact, here in, in New York, New Jersey area, where, where COVID hit so hard, we're, we're talking about back in April and May, there were no supplies, even in hospitals. You, you, there were pictures, images of of healthcare workers wearing shower caps on their head, garbage bags, you know, uh, rubber cleaning gloves on their hands, just just decked out in what they could barely find of, from their own cleaning supplies. I mean, this was um, U.S. hospitals uh, where there were uh, morgue trucks out the back door. So China sending plane loads that landed right here at Kennedy Airport went directly to hospitals. The same thing in Chicago and Detroit. Uh, this hardly had a line of press, but you could find it in the press here. But it w certainly wasn't publicized in any positive fashion. There was no thank you to China for doing this. Uh, and it went by the plane load and the train load uh, throughout Europe. Uh, these new high-speed trains that were shut down when China went into uh, complete quarantine. When they lifted the quarantine, the first train loads out carried millions and millions of um, masks and, and PPE equipment that went directly uh, both to Europe, to the Middle East, were shipped to Africa. Uh, just the images, and there's actually a number of articles in the book that deal with um, this question of the immediate equip uh, that came. Now, now, the book we finished um, in, in August, so this was before a real discussion of the vaccines, but the, the first emergency supplies came from China, and at that time, the U.S. message was any supplies would stay right here, and as a matter of fact, they, they literally, in the United States, um, equipment that was scheduled to go to other countries uh, were literally hijacked. Uh, so the, you could see the opposite thing happening. And the media has been a large part of all of this, about us not knowing what China is doing, about not knowing how the two methods have differed. Um, could you make a comment about the media, which has included you know, very respectable institutions like the New York Times? The, the media has provided endless, endless number of personalized stories, uh, attacks on, on the Trump administration, which is totally warranted, their, their complete callous disregard, uh, but very little in the way of, as I say, comparison, uh, unless it was propaganda stories, uh, very little that actually inform people. Now, w one thing, and we want to educate the whole population on the importance, so basic, wash hands, wear a mask, that's, that's not hard. Um, and yet it became hard. But nevertheless, the, there is a responsibility uh, of state institutions, and this is what is never covered in the media here, uh, the lack of a real health plan in the U.S., the lack of any coordination in the uh, in the testing, uh, and it was all done by private companies that that keep a tight hold. Uh, takes weeks to get a reply. Uh, from now now it's a little bit faster, but for months it made the testing all but irrelevant. 
uh, because you couldn't keep track of anything. There's just no coordination. And that was never really raised or discussed in the media. Occasional article you could dig through. Um, and I think it's what's valuable about the book. We went looking for who among uh, progressive political social activists are really looking at this in a more thoughtful way. Who's doing research on it? Can we collect these articles together? Uh, Vijay Prashad with, with two Chinese scientists did a series of articles. We included that in the book. Uh, Kevin Zeese and Margaret Flowers from Popular Resistance were following this very thoughtful way. Um, Margaret uh, Kimberly uh, with uh, Black Agenda Report, Black Alliance for Peace, uh, who among um, Vietnamese, among Cuban uh, authors, among Chinese American activists in the U.S. looking at um, suddenly facing this rise of uh, anti uh, Chinese attacks uh, and, and racist attacks, uh, the e expelling of thousands, tens of thousands of, of Chinese students from the U.S. So we, we tried to put this together because we felt all of these stories were kind of lacking uh, any kind of real overview uh, in the U.S. press. The U.S. press, the corporate media in the United States, uh, is completely enmeshed with the military establishment. And so they will justify with every possible way U.S. wars. L later they may critique it, but if there's going to be war with Iraq or Libya, Yugoslavia, or any country they target, the media speaks with one voice to demonize and that's what's so dangerous today as they increasingly demonize uh, China because that leads in one direction and, and China is not a small country. So the, the U.S. media, this, this combination uh, really of ownership between the corporate media and the military and oil corporations, the banking establishment, uh, in a way – the corporate media acts as a public relations arm for these huge corporations. And that means that the information that comes through is the public relations that these companies want. Uh, and it's certainly, it's so even all the more so true when we look at the medical industry, one of the most profitable, big pharma, <laughs> the big hospitals. This is an area of super profit today and therefore it shapes the way the media views the questions that are put forth and I think that's what we need to look at in a more critical way uh, how this merger of corporate interests and the role that the media plays and it also means that the alternative media has a more important role than ever before and is being more consciously shut down I think we all know the number of Twitter and Facebook and YouTube um, programs that are just shut down, no notice. And, and we face that also with this book. Yes. And when it comes to alternative media, also the algorithms that are yes. employed, you know, uh, to keep certain to keep certain outlets down and then to keep certain subjects down, you know, as well. I mean, it's 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 uh if you're paying any attention to all the particular issues, you'll so soon find yourself frustrated at how hard it is to find something now uh, compared to how it was five or 10 or 15 years ago. I think that it's been something that's been happening so slowly that most people haven't, haven't noticed it. And of course, you know, increasingly, uh, people in the United States who consider themselves, uh, progressive or, or liberal are, are getting a narrower and narrower view all the time from their own, you know, their own media, MSNBC, the New York Times, Washington Post, and are unaware that their, that their options are, are more limited than they were. And that's very true. The algorithms, uh, really even just in the last two to three years, uh, have just uh, cut out whole news services 
Uh, there are certain articles you can only find if you input the exact title and author and website, you know, okay, then you can find it on Google or one of the search engines, but you, it no longer pops up under articles on a topic. That's the algorithms at work. Uh, and the same thing happens in Facebook. Uh, what feeds go out? You think you're sharing a, a piece of information with all kinds of friends that goes to the bottom and doesn't even appear on lots of sites and of course with with twitter even more so so each new form of communication that comes up it's very exciting for a time uh people are always inherently curious they're trying it out and then it's a more and more controlled um measures that uh really restrict what we know and even the debates that we have and and this is certainly true, anything to do with even the topic of socialism, of national health care, of uh, what's a military threat, you know, what is promoted and what is not. And and sometimes we can think, oh, well, you know, we're, we're even so, it marginalizes our own thinking uh, that we more and more accept that we're almost insignificant in this. And in a way, what's happening is uh, there's a, a greater level of alienation from the corporate media. Lots of people distrust it. They don't know why. They don't know what other information to get, but they distrust what they're hearing from the corporate media. Now, depending on people are coming from that can mean that they're more prone to also conspiracy theories and all kinds of other uh information because they that level of distrust uh exists and they're being consciously directed in a right-wing direction the stories that they get yeah we're definitely seeing that too i wanted to bring this around to you know of course a lot of people have a hope that things are going to change now that the person sitting in the imperial presidency is changing uh, however there really is a bipartisan consensus on uh, most of these issues even it seems when it comes to quote following the science there was an article i just saw that came out yesterday or today in um jacobin that was showing that uh biden is already changing how he's talking about dealing with the pandemic. And worse yet, the scientists around him who are his partisan supporters are now changing their message as well to match his political message. And so it seems as though there's really not as nearly as much hope as people would like there to be from this change in administration when it comes to all of these issues. It's so true. I mean, Biden throughout his electoral run and uh, even after the uh, election, has promised again and again that there will be no substantial change. Now, we know he has always opposed uh, health care for all and always protected and defended and been the candidate of the big mili um, medical uh, pharmaceutical corporations. Their preferred candidate throughout the uh, entire uh, primary runs, uh, he was the one who most staunchly defended health care the way it exists now. There'll be a little tweak here and there, nothing of substance. That is the Biden position. And so here we are, as I say, in the midst of this raging forest fire, and uh, we're being told nothing will substantially change. And science itself will be distorted to make sure that nothing really changes. That's pretty shocking. That's a pretty grim future. Uh, and it's, it's, it's what we're hearing. Uh, we could look at the way even the earlier uh, Bernie Sanders campaign, the idea of free health care for all, and uh, that had to be defeated even if uh, there were huge popular support. And... Uh, we had a candidate who promised little except that he wasn't Trump. Well, all right, that that was important. Certainly Trump was a, a racist, uh, completely reactionary, uh, in, very important he be defeated. 
and yet defeated by someone who has promised no change. That's that it means. Um, what do we have to look forward to? Right. Obviously, uh, we need to organize on our own in many different ways from the bottom up in order to right. address the system. That's right. We do. Uh, let me say just one thing, by the way, on the um, censoring of this book. Because that was my next question. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, we can think, okay, we're going to always find a way through, and, and um, this was a, a small effort uh, to gather all the material that I could find at the time. Not all the material. We, we had to make selections and couldn't include all the things we would have had an encyclopedia, but um, to, to make a selection of articles uh, over a period of several months and also showing the, the pandemic is getting worse. I think one of the most interesting articles was an early article by the political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal that we included, and, and he's writing, I guess in March, where he says the, the – death toll is already 10,000 and fears it will get much worse. Uh, but at that time, it was, it was twice what China was, seemed extraordinarily high. Who could have foreseen? None of us, uh, 300,000. Uh, so you can see over months this changing. At any rate, in terms of the censorship, um, many small publishers, independent publishers, printers, uh, because of the restrictions, were shut down. Uh, nobody even answering phones or emails. Amazon, on the other hand, classified as essential workers, promised five-minute upload of a book, one-day turnaround, and uh, the book would be listed. So we thought, well, let's try this out. Uh, after we'd done all the work of compiling this book and so on, we put up a test. There was a book. Um, now, it was an unfinished book. So we went, uh, you know, I guess it was a little bit more than a week, a week, 10 days later, to put up the actual finished copy. And we had a message from Amazon that this is not an authorized view of COVID. Um, and due to the rapidly changing nature of information, we're only taking official sources of advice on the prevention and treatment of this virus. And uh, your book does not comply. That's so chilling for sure. That, and, and what was even more unusual is usually you don't get an explanation. Um, Barnes & Noble simply refused to get back to us, although they also promise almost immediate response. Uh, but we've not been able to even get an answer. But they're now owned by a hedge fund and, and uh, strictly a commercial question to them. It's no longer freedom of the press, freedom to publish. And with Amazon, that was also true. Now, I input the exact words that Amazon had sent us into Google search. And I thought, let me see if they sent this to anyone else. Well, it turned out that they had sent it uh, to um, other, other publishers who were putting forth absolutely quack tours. Uh, and one of them, uh, Brennan, who had been a right-wing darling, uh, putting forth on Fox and, and further QAnon and all kinds of places, saying that COVID didn't exist, that social distancing was all a myth, that the figures were a myth, and so on. Every possible way of, of uh, speaking against uh, any kind of uh, scientific approach. And had been, his book was also initially rejected. Uh, he got in touch with Elon Musk, one of the top wealthiest people, who tweeted at Jeff Bezos of Amazon, and it was reversed was not only reversed, but Jeff Bezos, who also owns the Washington Post, promoted the book. That's this astounding. completely quack book. Um, so if you have a multi-billionaire 
uh, and it was in the interest of Elon Musk who wanted to, to do away with any control on production lines uh, and was very hostile to the idea of social distancing. And also, this is in the economic interests of the Jeff Bezos, who was making billions of dollars uh, with Amazon and their warehouses and the most exploitative conditions. They don't want any kind of control over this. So it's in their interest to promote completely discredited reactionary theories and not in their interest to promote a book that's saying, let's look at how cooperation can make a difference. What can we learn from China? What can we learn from these other countries that are coping with this? That is rejected. Uh, even if you're a small publisher and Worldview Forum is not a, a big publishing house, uh, that book is rejected. So we had to go a more difficult route of actually, you know, print and how to do online and how to do all of this, which Amazon has worked out all these technical kinks. You can post a book. Uh, and many, many progressive authors now, of course, almost all are also listed on Amazon. Uh, but at just one tweak, they can also be turned off and, and suddenly told your book is not an authorized view. And you're off. You, you literally don't you don't exist in the world. So the book is up there and it just says now unavailable. That's a very chilling story. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it is. Um, but we can either accept it or challenge it. And I think that's the view we have. We can either um, accept this and get discouraged or we can become more combative under what we need, what information we need, what social mobilizations and political mobilizations we need uh, for, for this virus and for the future. And the book is available. You can get it. That's right. That's right. So tell us how to do that. Okay. Um, I think I, I sent you the, the link, so please include that. Oh, I definitely will. Uh, okay. Um, because it's uh, through Shopify, just an order fulfillment service. And it's also the book is uh, as a PDF, as a Kindle, is downloadable from Kobo. So um, K-O-B-O. -O. So either way, uh, you can get the book now, which is uh, quite a it was quite a, uh, a feat, but now it is available and we're getting, we are getting hundreds of orders. And I think uh, that will increase if there's a real questioning going on. Great. I'm happy to hear that. Well, I really appreciate you spending some time uh, with me today talking about this. I really do recommend this book to my listeners. I learned so much in this book and I also uh, appreciated the you know, the, the overall message, uh, I would say not of hope, but of encouragement, perhaps, that it has, uh, that um, there, of course, is another alternative, and that we can be working to build a world that's based on cooperation rather than competition. Yeah, that's the only future for us. If it's competition, we will not survive. Uh, even even in this period, whether it's a vaccine or testing or health care, or it, it's going to take a new conscious uh, choice of cooperation. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big C. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.